I uh, I did my best. I want you to know I, I I did my best to go 4K and to step into the new century. Um, my attempts were rebuffed, so I'm afraid that all my all, all my flaws will remain blurry. Uh, at least the flaws in my complexion, if not in my personality. Um, I'm, I'm gonna jump in today as I usually do, uh, reminding you, first of all, that there's a poll. I, I, I had some fun with the poll. Uh, I will address the poll question. It's about swearing. Uh, if you're watching this on Facebook and this has not popped up for you yet, uh, apparently what happens is is I, I'm recording this on Crowdcast, uh, which which plays nicely with others. Facebook, if you start on Facebook, it does not play it nicely with others. Um, but when I when it jumps over to Facebook, it sometimes takes a few minutes. So you guys are watching past Brent, and we all know that you should forgive past Brent all all of his um, all of his many transgressions. Um, but if 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 you want me to see your questions live, I will be doing the best I can to monitor those. And I do have questions queued up from before. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna start with those. Um, if if you uh, uh, we'll start with uh, Alex Devin from Facebook. Uh, Alex asked me uh, last month, or actually I think just yesterday. Um, are there any tours in the works uh, to visit the East Coast over the course of the next few months? Um, well, no, but. Uh, but I'm not content to not expand on a question because I do read Epic Fantasy. Um, the, uh, we do not have an East Coast tour planned. However, what we do have planned is we have a virtual tour that is that is coming together. I'm going to be doing, um, I probably should not talk details yet because I don't know if all of the others have confirmed yeses. Uh, I, I believe we're gonna have a virtual uh, bookstore hosts hosting us and we're going to have uh, me in conversation with some other authors, including uh, one uh, rapscallion who I, I couldn't beg off. I, I mean, I really tried, but they're they're forcing me to talk with this man that I I, I really really quite despise. Uh, but some of you apparently like, and I will not name names. You guys know me well enough that that's enough hint, I think. Um, so so no no actual East Coast tours, but we are hoping to work with some East Coast bookstores, uh, Midwest bookstores and West Coast bookstores, um, doing maybe one talk a week, uh, kind of centered around the launch of the uh, trade paperback of The Burning White. Uh, Dylan Engel asks, uh, the Night Angel series still has some of the darkest moments I've ever read. Do you pull this from personal experiences uh, or did you look to uh, historical documented examples? Uh, I, I, I talked a little bit about this uh, last time, uh, but I'll, I'll just hit it very briefly here. Um, I was working with with my wife's experience with you know child abuse cases and um, and questions of evil and, and and this and that. So in 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 some ways, no, I just totally made stuff up. I mean, I wasn't looking at historical cases of abuse that I was using, um, but at the same time, I was looking at. Um, at the kind of stuff that does happen in real life. And after I'd finished the book, I, I came across this, uh, after I'd finished writing, I don't know, maybe the second or even third book, I came across this article in the LA Times um, that was that was uh, like this in-depth interview uh, with a young man who'd been in gangs. And he, he said that in his experience, um, and, and it, you know, it was something ridiculous, like, like that all of the women in gangs, and and 90, 95 percent of the of the young men, the the boys and girls really, um, who were in gangs had dealt with sexual abuse, had been abused, um, which kind of made a lot of sense to me. I, I mean, obviously, I, I I have no idea if that statistic is true, but when you think about the sort of the soul destroying nature uh, of abuse and what it could do to people uh, and how people act out, uh, that made a lot of sense to me. So so so, and a lot of what he said was like this. The kind of stories he shared were like far more horrific than anything that I would put in my fiction, and and certainly more horrific than than I would wish to put my readers uh, through. Um, so 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 I, I want us to cr confront evil, but um, in those books, I wanted I wanted that particular evil for us to look at that. Um, but but in a way, fiction gives us a, a safe way to look at that. So um, I think that's I think that's kind of marvelous, and and also fraught with difficulties. Uh, the way the way fiction is is real and unreal at the same time, and, and how it uh, how it plucks those chords for us 
to uh, to to learn uh, about the truth from what are obvious uh, lies, right? Um, Jake said, uh, Andros is an amazing character. Uh, what's your inspiration beside, behind his emotional roller coaster you put us on? Um, you know, I've, I, I, I've just been reading this book on writing um, by, by a guy named, uh, named Saul Stein, um, uh, S-O-L-S-T-E-I-N. Uh, um, and, and he said that, uh, uh, he said that the writer's job is to take readers on an emotional journey. And I, I thought that was, a, I thought that was a wonderful thought. Um, and, and, and so thank you for saying that I, that I did that with, uh, with, uh, with Andros for you. Um, with Andros, I, I, I wanted to start with, um, um, with, with a character who's kind of an archetype. I mean, we've seen characters who are, who are um, <clears throat> uh, sort of the poisonous father, right? The 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 um, the the tyrant. The, uh, the he's sort of the the the, the architect is the flip side, the flip side of the um, <clears throat> of the good king. Um, he's uh, he's, <laughs> he's, he's utterly malevolent. Um, hold on, what is going on here? Um, there, that, that clears things up. Um, uh, and and uh, really threw me off my off my thoughts. Um, so so, so w when you think of uh, Braveheart, right? You you think of the the uh, the father, uh, Robert the Bruce's father, and you think of this guy. He's he, in, in in that you know they, they very little subtlety of Braveheart. You know they make him an actual leper. He's kind of hidden way up in his tower and he's directing everything and he's very, he's just poisonous and you feel his fingers everywhere. Um, in, uh, in Game of Thrones, it's, uh, it's a Tyrion Lannister. Oh wait, it's not Tyrion Lannister, it's uh, a Tywin, right? Okay, or however you say his name. Uh, Lannister, I, you know, I read the books and didn't watch the show. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so th that character is really familiar to us. So, so uh, or that, that character archetype is really familiar to us. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to take us, I, I wanted to start with that kind of archetype and, and then see where I could push it, see where I could take you with it and see, um, see what kind of an emotional journey I could take you on with that character. Um, and, and over a course of a really long time, like here's a character, one of the first things he does is he tries to kill the main character, right? Um, well, that's, that's fairly serious. He, he frustrates him in every turn. He screws him over every way he can. And, um, and, and I just wanted to give you, uh, along the way, this, this experience, like, I feel like, I feel like he's got a reason for all the stuff that he does. Uh, and, and I, I kind of respect him for certain things and maybe he respects himself too much for certain other things. Like he thinks he's so great, but he keeps on running into these troubles. And, and, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to change the reader's perception of that character very slowly, but without cheating, which, which is really easy for authors to do. Um, it's it's very hard for an author to write uh, an author if if they're not like say a, uh, a sociopath to write a really terrible character. Um, if you spend a lot of times with a terrible character and you're and you're the author, you find things to love in them, and and they they slowly become another facet of your personality, and it's hard to keep the character um, realistically terrible along the way, um, and. And yeah, I'm not going to use this time to critique any any writers in, in particular. So, so 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 with with uh, with Andros, that that was the that was the journey arc that I kind of wanted to take us on. I, so I said, can I can I bring you along on an emotional journey? Uh, even though I hadn't read the Saul Stein book at that point, uh, can I bring you along on a journey with this character who you really have no good reason to like? You can only respect him. And then as we unfold who he is, uh, which happens a lot, um, certainly in in the final book. Um, and there's there's other stuff that I haven't published still that tells more of his story, but I don't I don't know if I'll ever publish that. Uh, I'll have to find a good excuse someday. Um, <clears throat> can you can you come to root for him a little bit without without denying all the devastation he's wrought, or or um, without denying his essential character and and who he's become? Um, so that was, that, that, that was my trick with Andros, and and I've done similar things, not with. Uh, um, 
not with archetypes, but with stereotypes. I've, I, I, I took, I, I mean, when I was writing um, the Night Angel trilogy, I took basically uh, a stereotype of, of um, with Ferdiana Savari, right? She's like basically the silly character that you've seen a hundred times in, in, in terrible movies. It's like, oh, the, the big busty assassin, right? Like, 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 who is this person? This is like a, it's like the, the, the Hollywood fantasy of, you know, it's, it's not quite as bad as the girl who wears glasses and suddenly she's not pretty, but, but, but it's, it, it, it's, it's sort of this, this fantasy. And then I wanted to be, um, uh, that, that, you know, kind of falls apart if you think about it too much. Um, <clears throat> I I, uh, I wanted to take that character and then see if I could take you on a journey with this person and see if I could give you uh, reasons to to root for her a little bit without again denying the actions she's done that have had horrible horrible effects for people that you really care about. Um, so so that's a that's the thing I like to do sometimes G give you a hook immediately to understand who a character is. Okay, yeah, I, I get who this kind of character is, and then um, and then twist it and work with it and see if I can do something new and different. Um, Okay, um, uh, from Facebook, uh, Zalki Garago. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I always just take my best guess at at, at the names here, um, <clears throat> uh, which is especially hard for an American uh, be, because I, I was just thinking of this the other day. Um, Americans, we, we like butcher every name, but like we do it half on purpose, and and then we've been doing it for so long that uh, it actually serves a purpose. Um, but like, like I, I, I have a friend. Um, a, a colleague, another writer, whose uh, who, whose name is spelled um, it's it's Bradley, and and when you look at the name, you go it's it's what B E A U U L I E U, right? So I've taken some French, and and so I'm like sitting there going like, mm, okay, okay, so that's Bradley Beaulieu, right, or something along those lines. You'll, you'll have to forgive me again. Um, <clears throat> if it's from, from from France, and and he's like, yeah, no. It's Bradley Bollier, Bollier, because you know it comes over uh, Cajun, Cajun French, and does its little magic down south, travels west, and and, and you, so sometimes you see names, uh, American sea names, and they're like, okay, is that the West Coast pronunciation of that? Is that a Southern pronunciation of that? Or is that like the French pronunciation of that? Um, and so w w we're just. Uh, we're horribly ignorant, and and we have no hope, especially when just we have a name on a list. So sorry about that, um, Zalke. Uh, will we ever know what Durzo said to Kyler in that unknown language? Uh, greetings from Hungary. Oh, oh, there, I, Hungarian. Dang it, I should have known. Um, actually, that doesn't help me. Sorry. Um, will we ever know what Durzo said to Kyler in that unknown language? Um, I I I have plans, um, but not soon. Not, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you right now. So there there you have it. I'll still be difficult. That's why we call it question and response and not question and answer. Um, okay, let me, let me. Uh, I've, I've got a few more, but I, I wanna make sure everybody had a chance to, let me answer a live question before I, before I uh, okay. Um, okay, I'm not hopping on that one. Um, <clears throat> Early bird. Uh, hey, love your books. Uh, Gala says, just finished Burning White. Will there be more adventures for day for uh, Days and Gavin, Karis, and Kip? Um, there may be. Um, uh, not next. Not next. So I've I've definitely got a a book or two or three um, spinning in my brain uh, that are fighting their way to the forefront first. Uh, but I'm not slamming the door shut on those guys. Um, at least if any of those people happen to still be alive by the end of the burning white, which I'm not going to say they are. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, another earlier question from Dante. No, I'm not answering your question. Good, 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 good job. Thank you. Um, yes, I, so, some of those questions for how to interpret things, I want to leave to you. Uh, and, and even, even when I have really good answers to your questions, uh, one, they're really spoilery. Um, or, or, or two, I feel like I've given you enough to, to read into that from, from what's in the books. Um, and, and third, I don't like to tell people how to interpret the work. Um, even if, you know, I really want you to see how, how crazy brilliant I am and how everything fits together perfectly. I, I, I still try to respect you guys as readers. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see. We have, uh, from, from June, from, from, uh, gosh, 
It's already almost the end of July. Um, from from June's time, uh, Buck Fangs from YouTube says, uh, one of my favorite characters or experiments uh, from your books is uh, Fuck a Lot. Um, uh, love his name and how his nickname as a character sets up a gag. How did he come about? Um, well, that, that, that's a, that's a th thank you. Um, uh, he, he was a really minor character, right? And and in uh, in my books, there are. I, I mean, I start to figure this out as I as I go to the um, the glossary and the character lists, and I'm figuring out, good lord, how how many how many people are there actually in here? And and I just make up a ton, a ton, a ton of characters. And w one of the things I do with those characters is I really like to make the minor characters have um, even the really minor characters like like that guy. Uh, have a hook, um, look different from from other people, uh, stand out a little bit, like like they've got their own story, um, and 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 so as a, uh, <clears throat> and I I kind of went for the low hanging fruit with with him. Uh, clearly, he's a guy uh, who has Tourette's in in a world that, of course, does not understand what Tourette's is, um, and 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 he's a character who maybe, you know, maybe gets a uh, hundred words. In, you know, out of what 1.5 million words that that makes up that series, um, so so he doesn't have a whole lot of time to to shine or or to be fleshed out as a as a full human being. So I I, I kind of took the low hanging fruit with him, uh, and going with the with the Tourette's with with the swear words. Um, <clears throat> I, I I like to give my characters I I like to take my characters from a a lot of different kinds of. Uh, of diversities, I guess I, I would say it's like diversity does not just mean uh, skin color in these worlds. It, it means like um, uh, you know being different neurologically, or uh, having really different experiences, or looking really strange in in ways that might be alarming to other people. And for for him, he's not he's not a fleshed out character. I mean, he, he like I said, he he doesn't show up for very much. He's there briefly, and then he's and then he's kind of kind of gone. And and yes, I use that for humor. Um, or the other characters use it for humor. You know, they give them a nickname on it. Uh, other characters uh, in my in my books can be cruel in ways that, you know, obviously I would not um, would not appreciate in real life. Um, I, I I did have a uh, I had a friend a um, boss actually uh, in in real life who uh, who who had Tourette's and he he didn't have the the cursing ticks but he had some of the other ticks and it was it was definitely a, a, a real challenge for him. Um, but he handled it, you know, really gracefully. And, and so, so it, you know, if, if fuck a lot, had been a, a larger character, a bigger character who had a lot more screen time, I would have handled it differently. Um, but, but as, as it was, it's like, okay, here's a character. I want him to be interesting. And it's like, here's, here's this mass of humanity. All these guys are, are, are enslaved. They're under the decks. Everybody's half naked. I mean, if, if, if you've watched like Ben Hur or whatever, it's like everybody looks the same. There's no differentiation. And in fantasy novels, things can, things can look that way too. It's like everybody can kind of look the same. They're just, oh, these guys are just slaves. And I, and I, and I want to make them, um, I want to make them stand out a little bit, even if just for, just for a couple seconds that, that they're a human being and they're not just, they're not just this mass of slaves. There are all these different people who have been enslaved and they've got their own stories and we don't get to see all that, uh, but we get to see a little bit. Um, so, so, you know, it, it wasn't solely for the sake of humor. Uh, I, I, I try to have people with, uh, with all sorts of different medical conditions. I, I had this, um, I had this thought when I was a kid and may, maybe some of you had this too. Um, uh, and that was that, uh, that people out like adults out in the real world, like they knew what was going on. Like there are people, in charge and and things make sense to them. And then as I've I've uh, you know passed my fortieth year here, you, you start to realize that people are just making it up as they go along, and that's terrifying. There's there's nobody who, who's actually in charge and 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 uh, and knows what's happening. Uh, who, nobody who's really in control of everything. Um, like goodness gracious, that's that's terrifying if you think. This is close to Australia. This, but if you think our political leaders are just making it up as they go along and they don't really know what they're doing, that's scary, right? Uh, people with the big red button that can can uh, blow us all up. You you want to hope that they know what they're doing, and 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 when you find out that that very few adults actually do know what they're doing, that's kind of a a moment I think when you become an adult. Um, I I had the same kind of moment. I had a corollary to that kind of moment where I um. 
I, I dealt with somebody who was very unpleasant to me in a, uh, in a professional context and, and I hadn't done anything wrong to them. Like I treated them very well and they treated me really badly. I was like, what, what is the deal about that? <laughs> you know, why would, why would somebody be mean to you when you've only been nice to them? And, 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 and I had this moment where I realized like, I look into the world and I assume that the people I see are basically healthy human beings. Um, like probably I assume that both physically and psychologically. And, and I have no justification for thinking that. Um, like everybody is kind of broken. And so like this person who I, I was absolutely sure, certain I'd only had a, a very limited number of interactions with this person and I'd been very kind in all of them. Like they were working out their own stuff and it actually had almost nothing to do with me. I was just a placeholder uh, for their anger about something else. Um, and and I, they were working out their own, kind of their own issues, uh, which which made it very much less personal. And so I was able to kind of, kind of put it aside. Um, I mean, I didn't appreciate it still, but um, so, so I, I, I want to reflect that um, in my fiction too, is that is that we have this, this broad, um, again, to use the dreaded word, you know, diversity of, of characters who are, who are broken in interesting ways, um, which I think is also, which is also something that Saul Stein says. Uh, I, I, I think he said in this book, it's, it's like Saul Stein on writing or, or some silly thing. Um, uh, he was an editor for for many years with with many great writers, um, and and he said like a writer is a person who's broken in an interesting way, but not too broken. Um, I you have to be able to keep writing, um, but you want to be someone interesting with something interesting to say. So 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 I I, I haven't finished that book, but I, I recommend it so far on on what I've read of it. Um, <clears throat> all right, let me uh, let me let, let, let me jump into the uh, the questions here that I'll, I'll answer off the cuff. I'll, I'll grab a few more of these. Um, uh, all right, let's see. I'm just gonna start. Okay, uh, Dina Whitney from, uh, from Facebook said, food is not really highlighted in your books or the cultures besides poison drinks. Uh, but if you had to choose, what would be the favorite dishes of the Mighty Men members? Uh, what, are, what are some of your favorite foods? Who has the best tacos? Oh gosh. Um, okay, so. <sighs> So I basically, let's just say this. Um, I I love a great meal, and and I, um, I I I can really get a lot of joy from going to a fancy restaurant and having somebody make me fancy, amazing food that I've never had before, um, or make me fancy, amazing food that like I've had a steak a hundred times, and this is the best steak I've ever had or could imagine having, and now I don't ever want to barbecue again because everything after this will be a disappointment. Um, I, 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 can, uh, I can really enjoy the gustatory pleasures. Um, however, uh, I find that uh, I do not enjoy reading about other people's gustatory pleasures. Um, I, now, I, there is a train of thought that, that, that says um, you can tell a lot about a culture through their food. Absolutely true. Um, there's, there's a thought that like, look, if you just wanted the plot, you'd just read the spark notes of a book. The book is more than it. The book is more than its plot. It should be sumptuous. It should be full that this is part of the world building in a fantasy world. I get all that. I, and I, I, I cannot, I, I, I cannot really disagree with that, but what I found, um, in fantasy, and this might just be my own, um, particular brokenness, uh, which we were just talking about. Um, I, I, I am, uh, I do have ADD and I find descriptions of meals boring and, um, or I, 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 I find that I don't buy, um, like, okay, you, you want to describe a sumptuous meal. We're all at a feast. Describe the first course. Like, like, tell me all about it. Give, give me that first course at length and show me all the variety. Show me all the cultures they're pull, pulling from, all the interesting things they do that sound kind of disgusting and weird. But if you actually looked it up, you could probably find it in some medieval textbook or, 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 or recipe book. I get that. But like after, after one course, I, I got it. I got it. They're, they're eating fancy food. Uh, and it draws from the Roman Empire and it draws from the Greek Empire. And it, it has all these interesting spices. And, and like, okay, I, I, I see where you're pulling from. Uh, I see where these spices come from. I'm kind of getting the flavor of the world. No pun intended. Um, 
But then to do that over and over, page after page after page, it's just, it's not me. I, I don't like it. I, I, I don't want, um, that's just not what I'm going to hang out for. It's like, please talk to me about the food you're eating and I don't get to eat it. It's, 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 uh, it's boring and it's torture and boring torture is the worst torture to me. So I don't put it in my books. Um, I don't like to read it. So I, I don't write it. Um, probably I wouldn't write it very well. Um, and if I do write it, and I surely will someday, just because now I've talked about it, um, <clears throat> I don't think I've described any feasts at length at this point. Um, but 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 if I do it at at, at some point, uh, it will be along along those lines of like I'm gonna I'm gonna get in there, I'm gonna tell you all about certain things. I'm gonna do it for a very specific purpose, very specific point, uh, and then uh, the second feast you don't need to know about because the characters are gonna be paying attention to something else. And if the characters are paying attention to something else. Uh, I want the reader to be paying attention to those things. I, I, I want readers. I want to direct my readers' uh, eyes to the things that matter uh, to the characters, or the, maybe the, the things that are going to matter to the characters that the characters are missing right now. And so, if the uh, if what the food they're eating um, is doesn't have some bearing on what the characters are going to do, uh, what they're going to experience, if it's going to change the kind of decision they make, you know. You made me eat a bowl full of ghost peppers. Well, well, now that's that's important because now I'm going to kill you for doing that. Um, short of that, I I I find it, um, I I find it of limited use in setting up uh, the atmosphere of of a world. Um, so that's just me. Uh, clearly, other people who sell far more books than I do disagree, and uh, that's fine. That works for them. Um, I'm I'm okay with that. I'm okay with being wrong. I guess as it as it it must be the case that I'm wrong on this, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, let me scroll down. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, Jed Farber uh, from Facebook said, "What appealed to you most about the assassin character design? What got you thinking most about a world with these epic behind the scenes assassins?" Um, oh, I, uh, the. That was pretty simple, actually. Uh, I uh, I was I was young when, when I got started, and I just thought it was awesome. I just thought assassins were great. Um, I I thought they were really interesting. I was doing some martial arts myself. I thought, wouldn't it be good to be actually good at this? Uh, man, I can I can imagine what it is like to to do these things, but I cannot imagine what it is like to be really really good at them. Um, uh, it 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 allowed me to put uh, t together some of my um, uh, love for, oh, this is going to sound terrible. Um, let me explain. Don't take this quote out of context. Uh, I, I was going to say, so I'll, I'll give you the quote out of context. It allowed me to put in some of my love for violence. Um, so there's the quote out of context. Um, when, when I played football uh, in, in high school, I, um, I, I got reasonably good. I mean, reasonably good for, for Montana um, <clears throat> in, in a not enormous school. Um, and, and, and I really liked it. I liked the, um, I, I played a lineman and I played a, an inside linebacker and I loved crashing through and past other human beings who are trying to stop me. And um, there was something about hitting into people that was just delightful. And, and, and it, was, it, was, it was not focused on like, I want to hurt these people. Um, it, it, it was, you were going to try to stop me from doing something that I want to do. And I've got this brain and I've got this body. You've got that brain and that body. And can you stop me or can I stop you? Um, or, you know, can I do the thing that I want to do or, or, or can I stop you from doing the thing that you want to do, depending on if you're on offense or defense or, or what the play, play is like. So I could imagine what it was, what it would be like to be amazing at actual violence, um, I had I, I I'm way too pacifistic in in real life to actually want to hurt people or want to kill people, but I could imagine it. Um, and and so it like these assassin characters who are the best in the world at what they do, um, who who indulge that, who go there, who go to a place where I don't ever want to go, uh, but I could see the appeal of it. Um, uh, it it was just fascinating to me. And then I, and then I wanted to take it the next step, which was, um, okay, I'm a person who does not actually want to hurt people. I, 
I love violence, but only in an abstract way and not in a way that I would actually want to indulge violence. Um, how can I bring those two together? And how can, so, so I wanted to use the Night Angel trilogy to, to talk about violence. And like, if you do these things, what does that do to you as a human being? And if you try to be a whole human being um, and not a monster, uh, what does it do to you to treat other people as if their lives don't matter um, or as if their lives can be um, uh, bought and sold, purchased, uh, th th that you could purchase you know, blood with coin? Uh, those are kind of awful things. And, and so I wanted to bring those, uh, those tensions together or at least examine them. Uh, give them a good hard look and say, say, where does that bring us as human beings if young men love violence? And unfortunately, it seems like that's fairly common that, that they do. Um, and so, so, uh, so looking at those, those hard questions and getting to wrestle with them in fiction is one of the things that I really love. And that's kind of one of the ways that I structure my novels is looking at really hard questions, things that bother me, and seeing if I can get a little farther uh, with how I think about those. Okay, I'm going to answer one last question because I've been talking for more than a half an hour now. Um, wow, I just really zoomed in on that. That's amazing. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm still screwing things up even after all my great experience. Okay, one more question. Um, I just saw mm, steak in the in the sidebar. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, Okay, that's a quick one. Let's see. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> Adam asked me a, a quick question and it's flattering, so I'm going to answer it, uh, but then I'll do one more. Um, Adam J. Uh, C. A. Dang, that one's, I have no idea if I got that. Sorry, Adam. Um, says uh, f from Facebook says, Hey, Brent, you look great. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You are a kind liar and I love you for it. Um, how did you come up with such a brutal way to kill Hugh Gibbet? Um, and the answer is, I have no friggin' idea. Um, I I I love toying. I love toying with these things in in fiction. We really, really want the guys who are really, really bad um, to be killed in creative ways, like like the movies that have really creative ways of of, of killing um, the villains. Gosh, we love that. That's just like, especially if it's kind of like. Uh, you know, poetic poetic justice or something. We love that. It, it, it's really the the one place where Disney has to suck because everybody's just got to fall to their death, right? And and usually because it was their own fault. You know, they they pull off a thing and ah, oh, they fall to their death, and then you don't have to watch the body splatter. Um, so I uh, I I I thought I thought Hugh um, I thought Hugh we should we should indulge that a little bit. I I, I was I was. Uh, I ran across that section the other day, and, and I thought, if anything, I, I'd explain a little more. But that might just be because I'm an old guy now, and I've and I've I've settled down so much. I'm just old and boring, and I describe things more. Um, man, the number of times in Night Angel where I'd have like a little 500 page scene, or sorry, a, a little not 500 page, that's now, um, uh, like like a little 500 word scene, like some little tiny scene. You just get, get in, something happens, you get out. You're like, I have no idea where that happened, but those people hated each other and somebody died. That was amazing. Um, and, and, and now I'd really set the tone and, and you would, uh, you'd really get to experience what those characters are doing and you'd have bigger emotions, uh, but it would just take longer. And, and, and I, I just, sometimes I have a little, uh, midlife crisis about, does this mean I'm getting to be an old fart when I, when I, when I really want to slow down and let you really soak in it, you know, next I'm going to be writing uh, feast scenes. Good heavens. Okay, uh, dang it, that was a good place to stop, except I didn't stop. Um, okay, this one got two questions, so uh, two upvotes, so I'm going to answer it even though I have no idea what it's about. Hey, Mr. Weeks, I enjoy writing dialogue, battle, strategy, and action. You know, the good stuff. Uh, however, the small descriptions of scenes and settings kill me. I started re re reading Robert Jordan to try and get a feel for it. Do you have any good tips? If you could just snap your fingers and make that happen for me, I greatly appreciate it. Okay, here you go. Um, no, that was it. I, I just snapped my fingers, and so I think that that should fix it for you. Um, here's the thing. You don't have to be good at everything. Um, if you have, if, if, if you enjoy, and you make your readers enjoy your dialogue, your battle strategy, your action, um, you're almost done. 
if you write the right kind of book. I mean, the premise has got to fit that kind of book, right? It's like the story you're telling should match the gifts that you have to tell that story. If, if, if you're trying to write like a Jane Austen novel, those those skills are are not going to help you very much um but there are certain kinds of fantasy you can get away with having mostly that be your thing um my my suggestion for a uh, a trick would be um <clears throat> think about what the reader needs to know in order to make those scenes uh make more sense to them um if, if you have two characters who are sitting there talking and they're they've got really snappy dialogue and the reader is, is like this is just in a fog. This is two floating heads on cable TV arguing with each other. Um, ask yourself, would this be a more interesting scene? Would this make readers feel more if I had this scene happen in a dark alley over a dead body? Um, if I had this scene happen uh, in front of character A's, you know, uh, 15 royal guards and, um, and they want to kill character B. And character B is is being really rude. He's being equally rude here. Like like if you can use the setting, um, uh, the surroundings, the scenery, uh, and and that can be the other people there. It can be the lighting. It can be the time of day. It can be anything about that that setting. Um, if you can use the setting to help your fiction, why wouldn't you add that stuff in? And you can add that stuff in where it becomes relevant to the characters. So if it's not relevant at first, if they're not really aware of of their 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 old buddy has has fifteen of his royal guards with him. They're not aware of that. Like, okay, he shows up with these guards. You know, you just mentioned it as a throwaway at the beginning of the scene because it doesn't matter to to your character. Um, you can bring that up in at the point in the scene where violence is almost threatened, and then all of a sudden he becomes very aware of those fifteen guards and goes. Wait, 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 am I really going to say this thing when those guys look like they want to beat the snot out of me? And, oh, nobody knows I came here. I just re remembered. I didn't tell anybody where I was going tonight. You can bring those things up where they matter to the characters, and I think that will make things a lot easier for you because you know your characters, and, and you know what they're thinking and feeling and experiencing, and you use the the set dressings. The setting should be in service of, of what makes this matter more to them. Um, and, and ask yourself, what is the setting where this could be the most interesting, what is the most interesting setting for this conversation to happen in? And try not to have it be the same place, you, you know, try not to go back to an inn 50 times in your novel. Oh, they're not standing outside in front of a house 20 times. They're having each thing in a different place. Like that's the beauty of, um, the beauty of writing novels is, is we have no constraints. We have no budget constraints things should happen in interesting settings because all you got to do is say this is an interesting setting oh now they're in a cathedral they're supposed to be quiet and they're cussing at each other and there's a priest there well when does the priest intervene well he can intervene at the point when when it's most interesting for them you know what are they going to do if they get kicked out of there you know are there bad guys outside um you can do all these things to help yourself uh while still um sticking to your big guns, which which hopefully the things that you enjoy writing are the things you're best at. And that, that usually is the case. Um, okay, that is everything I've got for you guys today, except for the poll question. Um, <clears throat> okay, I, I, I'm sure I have a skewed, and I, oh, I have a small vote here. I'll have to see if if, uh, if my Facebook people are are uh, more sweary than you guys. So the, the, uh, the poll was a delicate poll on swearing in fantasy. Um, and if you're watching this later on on YouTube, I'll have to uh, I'll have to like put a comment or something, and then you can upvote the comment that does the right you know says the right thing for you. Unless I can figure out polls on YouTube, which I may or may not. Uh, a delicate poll on swearing and fantasy. I think uh, option one: F words are never necessary. You make up everything else. Why not make up your swear words? Um, this uh, is. Um, uh, uh, Terry Brooks said this to me, you know, he, he sort of said, you know, hey, I think it's a failure of your creativity if you can't come up with ways for the characters to express themselves without swearing. And and I absolutely see the point. Um, I don't agree with it. Uh, so whoever voted for that, you, you're wrong. Kidding, kidding. Valid point, just wrong. Um, uh, no, option two, sailors don't say darn. Made up swears sound ridiculous, swear away. Uh, and that one, that one carried the day oh, over here. Um, uh, that's that's mostly 
that's mostly where I land. Um, and 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 option three, uh, real swears can be part of the tapestry, but should be uh, should uh, show up as infrequently as possible. Um, it, it, it's a funny thing. Um, I I think that uh, dialogue uh, should have verisimilitude, right? Um, and, and that's a big word that just means life likeness. It shouldn't be real. If if you go out, if if you're an aspiring writer, go out and tape actual conversations, and then run them through some transcript service, and you will see that actual conversations are nearly impossible to follow. There's there's so many um, there's so many gaps. There's so many places where you fill stuff in because you can tell that the other person tells what you're can knows what you're about to say, so you just skip it. There's so many places where people repeat themselves over and over and over and over and over. I mean, how many overs did I just say there? Were all of them necessary? Absolutely not. Um, and, and, and there's so many circumlocutions, there's so many um, uh, lacunae. Um, so I just had to throw in all the other big words. Um, <clears throat> and the same thing happens with swearing. It's like, you could listen to people who swear and, and it is not, you know, it is not literally every other word, but you'll have people who will swear almost every other sentence. And so you, you, you'll you'll watch it. I, I think the movie that has the most isn't The Departed. I think it's like The Wolf of Wall Street or something, which, which I haven't watched. But you, you'll have like a movie, and in two hours, they have 200 swears or 250 swears or something. It's like, that's ridiculous. It's like, it's grating. It, it, it just rubs on you, especially if you, um, as part of the audience, if you've grown up around people who do not swear. And then it just sticks out. And, you know, and again, there's an argument to be made for that that I'm like, in these movies, I'm I'm just dipping you into a completely different culture, um, but then then there's Terry's point too of, of like, hey, I get it, you know, okay, swear at me twenty times, I get these guys swear all the time, and you know, sprinkle it in when when they've got moments of 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 high passion or or or, or it's just funnier when they say it with the swear words, and and sometimes, um, in the English language, there is nothing that quite comes across the way the F word does. There are um, uh, there are emotions that are nearly impossible to express quite as uh, quite as quickly and quite as fluently as as a good F word placed placed in just the right spot. So I I, I do think it can get grading. Um, I definitely understand some people have a moral problem with with writing or reading uh, lots of F words. That's totally fine if it, if it fits the setting of your world. You can avoid them completely. Uh, I I think you can use them as uh, an exclamation point. I, I, I read a friend's novel and he had, um, he had like three F bombs in, in the entire book. And I said, why don't you trim it down to one and just have it be at the one place that is, is the emotional high point for that character, an emotional crisis point for that character and just one. And then maybe you can also get your book into libraries. Um, I do think some, some writers take out all the F words so that they can be, uh, get their books into libraries, which, I don't really like that kind of externalized thinking. I don't like marketing thinking, um, dominating artistic thinking, but I also get it. I also understand uh, people people need to pay rent, uh, pay the mortgage. Um, so so I try not to uh, I try not to swing too far that way. Uh, I try to I try to tone it down. I say, yeah. um, are are there ways that the character would say this uh, that get across their meaning uh, as quickly and as easily as this, uh, and would they talk this way? Um, and, and, and I like to have characters who express big emotions and never swear. Um, that's again part of the diversity. And then there's other characters just that just say, oh, "We come back around to it, and maybe here we'll stop." There are characters who will just say, "Fuck," a lot. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, really good to see you. I will. Uh, I will stick around. I'll. I'll um, uh, I'm going to wrap this up. I'll check on Facebook and. Uh, probably won't be posted yet on YouTube, but I'll. I'll answer whatever questions I can quickly. Uh, and then I'll come back again tomorrow and I'll, I'll hit a few more. Uh, if you have further questions for me, you can leave them here uh, or you can leave them on Facebook. You can leave them on YouTube. We'll collect those and we'll try to answer those next month, possibly even in 4K. But my track record is not that good. Thank you so much for joining me. See you next time.